Hello ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our last installment or lecture in our evolution unit. Now, what we're going to do today is look at the concept of speciation. Now you guys have uh, extensive experience in uh, looking at microevolution or this change in allele frequencies in populations uh, from the what paper airplane activity that you did to the beans that you've counted. We've looked at how uh, allele frequencies can change the population either due to chance events like drift or uh, through the forces of natural selection. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum is this concept of macroevolution, these large-scale changes that we see uh, in the tree of life. So you have these divergences of groups that lead to uh, vastly different uh, features. So, you know, development of uh, quadrupedal organisms or the development of lungs or vertebra. Um, or a vertebral column. Uh, those sorts of large-scale uh, changes are seen in the fossil record and are studied in macroevolution. Now the bridge between uh, these two uh, levels of evolution is speciation, these new species that are created, because you have sufficient changes in allele frequency to create uh, new populations or new species that can uh, eventually over time uh, acquire uh, vastly different characteristics from the original population. Now, looking at what speciation is, well, Charles Darwin wrote on the origin of species, but he didn't really get into too great a detail about actually how new species are created, which makes sense because he didn't have uh, a great understanding of sort of the bio or the um, molecular uh, interactions that occur to create new species. Uh, now, you can see organisms like the flightless cormorant and realize that they're likely related to organisms in mainland South America, uh, but again, it's sort of understanding what happens at a molecular level that makes our understanding of species uh, and their creation uh, much more significant at this point in time. So how you define a species is actually somewhat tricky. If you ask someone how they define a species, they may give you uh, examples like um, physical features, which are certainly uh, a part of that. Now, uh, what your book focuses on and what uh, many biologists use is the biological species concept. The whole idea is you have this population uh, with similar characteristics that are capable of producing offspring that are themselves uh, fertile, which makes sense. Oops, excuse me. So Frankie, uh, if you hear this, you need to get to the guidance office. Anyway, um, the biological species concept says that organisms can produce offspring uh, that are viable, so they'll survive, and uh, those offspring will be able to reproduce. Now, a great definition of a species, but there is a significant shortcoming of that. Virtually all species that have ever existed, you know, estimates range anywhere up to 99%, uh, have gone extinct. So we have this extensive fossil record with billions of years of life uh, stored uh, in sediment but we have no way of understanding or knowing if those organisms represented in those fossils would have been able to produce viable fertile offspring. So we have to sort of expand our uh, cadre of definitions for uh, species. Now morphological definitions uh, are based on obviously morphologies or these physical features uh, that's tied to this paleological uh, definition. Uh, if we look at uh, features of organisms, we can see how they are physically distinct. You can look at Archaeopteryx and recognize that it has uh, certainly features of reptiles, but it, it also possesses birds. So this sort of transitional species between reptiles and birds uh, that is distinct from uh, those two groups. Uh, let's see, you can also have ecological niches, so uh, species that uh, though quite similar, will occupy different niches uh, within an environment. So they may, you know, live at uh, different depths of the water, or they may uh, nest in different parts of uh, trees. Uh, so as a result, they are reproductively isolated from one another. So we have all these different uh, competing definitions uh, of species. Now, certainly some um, confirm or support one another. So you have this biological definition. Uh, it may uh, confirm morphological definitions of species. So again, we can also look at these phylogenetic uh, definitions where you look at uh, DNA or we look at proteins and look at similarities between species. And in many cases, uh, these uh, definitions corroborate one another. Now, this is the key idea of the entire chapter 
It's that speciation is about reproductive isolation. The whole idea is if you can prevent populations from sharing genes with one another, if you can stop gene flow, then that can potentially uh, lead to uh, sufficient changes to cause uh, differenti differentiation into different species. So again, the whole process, if someone had to boil it down uh, to its most basic idea, is that species happen or species are created when you stop gene flow between populations. So please uh, make sure you commit that to memory and have a good understanding of that. Now, how do we stop gene flow between populations? Now, um, there are all sorts of ways to uh, look at how to prevent uh, populations from being able to reproduce. But again, you can boil it down to a couple of basic ideas. There are prezygotic barriers uh, or some certain mechanisms that prevent uh, fertilization from occurring. And then there are post-zygotic barriers. So organisms or species may be able to reproduce, but they're not able to create a uh, viable offspring or it creates sort of like a, a biological dead end. Now, your book has a lovely spread that looks at uh, some of the various uh, mechanisms that prevent gene flow between populations. And we'll just zoom through some of these here. Now, obviously, uh, organisms that could potentially interbreed may live in different habitats. And as a result, uh, gene flow is reduced uh, or potentially stopped. Uh, let's see. Temporal isolation is also possible. While populations may have territory that overlaps, if they reproduce at different times, then uh, gene flow is slowed or effectively stopped. Uh, let's see. Certainly behavioral um, traits are associated or you know, certain rituals are associated with reproduction. Uh, and if a subpopulation does not share uh, those rituals or perform those rituals, then it won't be able to interbreed with mem other members of the population. Uh, for instance, the blue-footed booby, uh, the males have a dance that they do as part of their courtship ritual to sort of um, point out their blue feet to females. So that sort of helps differentiate them with the uh, red-footed boobies uh, that share some territory on the Galapagos Islands. There can be mechanical barriers between species. Uh, this particular species of, I believe, Japanese snail uh, has an allele that causes the shells uh, to spiral in one of two directions. And if the organisms have the different alleles, then uh, given the shape of the shells, their genitals are not able to align uh, for reproduction. So that provides sort of a mechanical barrier uh, to the production of uh, offspring. Another barrier that prevents uh, different groups from uh, producing uh, zygotes is uh, sort of gametic isolation. Uh, the classic example is a sea urchin like you see here. Sea urchins release their egg and sperm uh, into the water so they have this external fertilization that occurs in the water. And what happens is that uh, fertilization between different species is prevented because there are protein markers and receptors on the surface of the eggs uh, and sperm. So we know that uh, for receptors and ligands to um, join up. They need to have complementary shapes. It's no different here. Uh, the sea urchin species have particular uh, receptors uh, on the surface of their uh, uh, gametes that allow them to fertilize members of their own species but not different species. Uh, let's see. Oftentimes uh, hybrid individuals uh, may have uh, allele combinations or chromosome combinations uh, conformations that uh, make them particularly frail. So they may, you know, die as uh, embryos or uh, die before they reach reproductive age. So this has allowed fertilization to occur, but again, that early death of the organism prevents uh, the continuation of the line. Uh, Post-zygotic barriers, uh, you can, you know, mate a donkey and a horse to produce a mule, but, but mules are sterile. Uh, given the different uh, chromosomal composition, of the uh, parent organisms, you create this sort of biological dead end once again. And um, sort of in line with this idea of uh, reduced viability, you could have uh, offspring that, again, easily uh, are damaged and destroyed. So um, we need to look at the two big means of producing these new populations. And the first of which is what's called allopatric speciation. With allopatric, think it is separate locations. There's a physical barrier that separates uh, populations. 
So you can imagine a, a, a river, a mountain range, whatever the case may be, separates populations. And in these new distinct uh, environments, organisms may need to, or I'm sorry, populations may need to adapt in different ways. And that can lead to sufficient changes uh, to prevent uh, successful reproduction should those populations even have the opportunity to meet again in the future. So the whole idea is you have a physical barrier, you know, imagine a mountain range uh, cropping up, and what that does is create different environments uh, for the different populations without gene flow uh, or this reproductive isolation, the populations can evolve in different directions. So uh, with this sort of Rocky Mountain uh, example, you can imagine that on the westward side of the mountains, precipitation levels will be higher because as the air rises up over the mountains, it'll cool and precipitation drops. Um, I'm sorry, the air will be uh, more moist uh, on the western side of the mountains. Now on the eastern side, a lot of the precipitation has been lost. Uh, so you can think of like the plains, uh, the eastern plains on the east uh, side of the Rockies uh, having less precipitation. So, you know, you have this huge geographic barrier of the mountain range separating populations. And as a result of uh, differing environments, populations need to adapt in different ways. Now, it is possible for populations to um, evolve uh, while still sharing the same geographic area. And this is what's called sympatric speciation. Now sympatric speciation is less common uh, and it is more often seen uh, in plant species than in animal species. But it is uh, specifically uh, a means of producing a new species but without having a, a physical barrier. So think sin, S-Y-N, meaning same. So it's the same country or same location uh, but uh, they evolve uh, sufficient differences. So it's typically a situation where some subpopulation becomes reproductively isolated from the larger population. It could be, you know, this small subpopulation starts to take advantage of new niche space or that uh, sexual selection occurs and females choose males of one of two varieties and as a result of that the populations experience disruptive selection and uh, begin to excuse me, the populations experience disruptive selection and begin to uh, evolve in different directions. So uh, please make sure you're clear on the differences between sympatric and uh, allopatric speciation. Here's a nice visual to end on for this segment looking at how uh, these two processes can differ. In the first scenario with other country or allopatric speciation, you have this physical barrier crop up and the separated populations uh, have no gene flow and um, evolve in different ways to you know, survive in different environments. With sympatric speciation, there is gene flow that uh, does occur and can occur, but you have this smaller uh, subpopulation that starts to have re restricted gene flow and begins to evolve in different directions.